Chapter 10 of Intimate Talks with Movie Stars. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Intimate Talks with Movie Stars by Edward Whitesall. Louise Glau's touching human document story is interrupted by the nameless one. In many ways, the publicity promoter is an asset to a moving picture star, but it isn't a bit of use to an interviewer when one of these human interrogation points is after simple facts rather than seeking to record the spectacular flight of a soaring not to say daring fancy i found this out when i had a chat with louise glaum her enterprising press agent made the preliminary arrangements and offered to be present said i to myself all right young man but this affair is for the sole purpose of picking up a few little anecdotes about miss glaum that may interest the public and you're not going to ring in a lot of publicity about her latest picture. It took quick work to head him off. I'm not going to give him the satisfaction of using his name, but the moment the introduction was over and we were seated in Miss Glam's suite in the carriage, he started to get in his best professional touches, and directed my attention to a number of photographs on the table. Here are some of Miss Glam's pictures in the costumes she uses in sex. Isn't this stunning? he demanded and held out a photograph of the actress that would make any woman with a leaning toward Paris gown stop, look, and wish for one like it. I pretended to give the photograph a careless glance and tossed it back on the pile. Turning to Miss Glam with my most reassuring smile, I spoke as one who had no interest in such matters. Tell me something about yourself that will make a good story, I began. Tell me about your twenty-four gowns for the new picture put in eagerly the one who shall be nameless here is the latest thing in dancing frocks miss glam wears this when i merely waved the picture aside we may as well come to an understanding at once young man said i this is to be an interview and not an excuse for grabbing space to advertise the wardrobe of your star the contents of a press sheet is very important matter when printed in the proper place, but I want short human documents about Miss Glaum that smacketh not of the publicity stunt. Once more I turned my back on the nameless one. Have you a straight picture, Miss Glaum? I asked. Only this one with my dog, replied the impersonator of the lone wolf's daughter, picking up an at-home picture of herself sitting on a bench under a tree and holding an alert-looking Boston bull in her arms fine dog where is he now out in california yeah poor little fellow he broke his leg and i had to leave him behind tell mr whitesell about the part he was going to play in sex came promptly from the los angeles word juggler who was turning over the leaves of a scrapbook and giving out signs of a feverish desire to read aloud one or two dozen articles of his own composition touching upon the merits of the glam releases for the third time i turned to miss glam will you kindly ask this publicity person of yours to leave the room or henceforth hold his peace i almost implored a press agent who holds his peace can't hold his job interjected the irrepressible one before miss glam could reply to my request and it's straight goods about the dog's part in sex he added once more i endeavoured to pursue my talk with miss glam if anything of the amusing nature really did take place while you were at work upon the picture, I know that your many admirers would be delighted to learn the particulars, I remarked, with all the dignity at my command. Several funny things happened, replied Miss Glam, but the most amusing little human document I recall was the five-year-old child we used in another picture. The little girl was as bright as a new pin, and a born actress but her mother instinct completely ruined quite a number of feet of film when she came on in one scene leading a three-year-old boy the little fellow was wearing a pair of rompers and looked so cute and cunning his sister was supposed to be very proud of him and she did this so naturally that we were all charmed with her but when the cameraman started to take the scene the little tot put in a piece of business that broke all of us up and made a retake necessary just as she got well on the scene with her brother she discovered that one side of his rompers had become unfastened and she immediately dropped on her knees and proceeded to make him ship shape the scene itself was a serious one and when we grown-ups couldn't restrain our laughter there was nothing to do but retake this scene she didn't get scolded for it of course not the first time but that pair of rompers was cursed with buttonholes that were too large for the buttons 
and one side or the other would manage to become unfastened before the scene was completed. The little girl would try her best to take no notice of the expose, but modesty always triumphed over art, and down she would go on her knees and repair the damage. Miss Glam laughed heartily at the recollection of the incident, and so did I. But the nameless one looked pained. "'Oh, I say, Miss Glam," he protested, with near tears in his voice, "'he can't use that story. It's about an old picture. Please tell Mr. Whitesell about your Boston Bull and why he didn't appear in sex.' The owner of the dog looked pensive, and again picked up the at-home picture. "'We were terribly disappointed,' she said. "'The poor little fellow knows so many clever tricks that we concluded to use him in the photoplay, and Mr. Sullivan, the scenario writer, wrote in a part for him. The day before we were to start rehearsing his scenes he ran away, a thing he had never done before. He was gone two weeks, and when he did return his leg was broken. We couldn't wait for it to mend, and so his part in the picture had to be cut out. "'But that didn't hurt the picture any,' spoke up the faithful dispenser of important information. "'And Miss Glam's two dozen gowns that she wears in sex are the finest examples of the Paris dressmaker's art ever brought to this country.' Determined to shut off this stream of eloquence by the only possible means, I brought the interview to an abrupt close, and bade Miss Glam good afternoon. As I stated in the opening paragraph, no publicity promoter can put it over on me when I'm after a human interest story. It may be his duty to get the name of his star and a list of her gowns into print as many times as possible, but he must get along without any help from me. End of chapter 10